In my last three videos, I've talked about democracy, why it's impossible under a state, why the system's not broken but works the way it was designed, and why democracy as we know it is not that different from dictatorship, except that we have a little bit more freedom. In this video, I'd like to move past the critique and look at how the people around you and you can take back your freedom without having to beg for it from the people who stole it. In other words, we'll talk about real democracy. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. I'd like to start by laying down the difference between government and governance. It's pretty simple. Governance really just means any way of making and enforcing social rules. All human societies have had some kind of governance. Government is a form of governance where a small minority of that society centralize or concentrate power over everyone else. They make and enforce rules in their own interest. If you're anything like me, you don't want that kind of governance. You want freedom. You want justice. And you don't trust the state to give them to you. So how could things be more democratic? What if, instead of letting our so-called representatives do all the voting, we voted for things directly? So, you know, every time there's a bill or a law, we all get a vote on it. Maybe there could be an app where we get a notification that there's a vote coming up and we vote yes or no. That sounds democratic, but I still don't like it. If politics were still conducted on a national scale, we'd still have people who don't know each other imposing their will on others. And if anyone could just put forward a bill that would govern everyone else, at some point people would get weary of voting and just ignore it. Maybe there's a better approach. Do you know about Dunbar? In the 1990s, anthropologist Robin Dunbar suggested the number of stable social relationships an individual can have caps out at about 150. In other words, we can know about 150 personally and well, but not much more than that. Others have said the number is somewhere between 100 and 250, and it probably varies with the individual. And since we're talking theoretically here, let's just go with Dunbar and assume 150. It seems that whenever groups of our hunter-gatherer ancestors got too big, they'd split. That way, no tribe would get so big you couldn't have a personal relationship with the rest of its members. Now let's translate that to modern life. A country of millions of people is not a tribe. You, you couldn't possibly know everyone in it. So when decisions are made for an entire nation state, there's really no way to take the views and concerns and interests of everyone into account. True democracy in such a situation is impossible. So no one even asks for your consent anymore. But what if we made decisions in groups of 150 or less? Think about where you live. Do you live in an apartment complex? Maybe a neighborhood of houses? How many people live there? Do you think they might be interested in making their own decisions? It might take a year or two of convincing. But if they're interested, they would be a great unit of governance. There are several ways of building small-scale democracy, including in the workplace, uh, perhaps with a cooperative where people own and operate it together without hierarchy, or in a union. And all social movements should be non-hierarchical and inclusive, or else they won't lead to a non-hierarchical, inclusive society. Democracy in the workplace or in social movements are whole other topics, and I'll be making videos on them at some point, for sure. 
But, of course, there's a lot online already that you could look at on starting cooperatives or unionizing or starting a social movement. And I shouldn't be your only source of information on these subjects anyway, right? The more of these properly democratic organizations, the better. But I think the most important vehicle for democracy is the community. Murray Bookchin once said in 2001, I think it was, the overriding problem is to change the structure of society so that people gain power. The best arena to do that is the municipality, the city, town, and village, where we have an opportunity to create face-to-face -face democracy. So why does the community have so much potential for democracy? Well, it's in that those last few words there, face to face. The first reason is you know each other. That's important. Most people usually don't want to take advantage of and hurt the people they know. And if it's a small group of people who know each other, it probably won't take long to identify those one or two people who are hurting you. Second, if in some unforeseeable way someone becomes a neighborhood tyrant, it's easy for the rest of the people to just remove them. Third, you live close together. As such, your decisions will be on local matters, like how to fix potholes, how to stop flooding, um, how to talk to the guy whose noisy dog barks all night. What to do if there's an armed communist uprising near your home when you're having a party? <laughs> yeah, just like that. Exactly. So, everyone in the community could agree on and sign a charter or constitution. When someone dies or moves away, they no longer have a vote. And changes to the rules are fine. You just need a consensus among those the charter applies to. If new people want to come to the neighborhood, they need to sign up too. That way, people would opt in to this system of rules rather than being forced into it. How would you enforce rules? Well, if you value freedom, justice, compassion, friendship, and community, you aren't likely to set up a jail to cage people just because their music is too loud. There would be procedures to deal with these issues. So, for example, maybe the first time someone plays loud music all night, you knock on their door and ask them to stop. Maybe the second time, they get a written warning signed by all the adults in the community. The third time, they get a fine of some kind. And the fourth time, you kick them out. And if you have a better way of solving the problem, great! Write it down, propose it at your neighborhood constitutional congress, and argue your case. You're on your way to an autonomous, sovereign community. And the thing about governance on a small scale is most of what we would call enforcement of rules just takes care of itself. People internalize rules, especially the ones they believe in. Most of these rules are just norms. I mentioned in a video a month or two ago, I, I support your freedom to, rock, to walk around naked in public. But most people don't. So imagine if you really did go downtown naked. People wouldn't let you in places. They would shout at you, or at the very least, point and laugh. That's their way of unconsciously enforcing this norm or rule, regardless of what the law says on paper. A community can be a great basis for self-defense. We're afraid of small-scale crime like assault or theft, right? Strong communities take care of people so they don't need to steal. They raise children collectively so they don't have the long-term detrimental effects of insecurity and stress so many of us have grown up with. They make joining a gang unnecessary. 
They care for addicts, or people with mental illnesses, or disabled people. It's really only in the past couple of hundred years since capitalism has forced its way into every street and every home that community in this sense of the word has been lost. But maybe that's not self-defense, strictly speaking, so much as preventing violence. So maybe there's some kind of neighborhood watch. It's an easy task nowadays to alert others if there's a reason to worry. Most of these are details that the individual community would work out for itself. Would democratic communities need prisons? Prison is a state construct. It doesn't exist because there are millions of evil people in the world who need to be locked up in cages. It exists because the state needs its threats of violence to have real consequences. Prison is a threat and a punishment, and it destroys families and it destroys lives. Compassionate and free societies do not lock people away just to punish them. All kinds of prevention and reconciliation need to be tried before we resort to prison. Prison should only be for that very small number of people who are incorrigibly violent. And then it still needs to be a facility for care, not for sick citizens to watch as sick guards assault and abuse sick prisoners. It could be more of a challenge to a free community if there's a real invasion an aggressive external enemy trying to take over your community and forcibly incorporate it into a state or empire. Any given community could fall prey to that. So how do we deal with a full-scale invasion? The short answer is confederation. Confederation means the decentralization of power and decision-making. In this context, it means communities working together in solidarity. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon wrote of a confederation of confederations, communities working together across all borders to solve any problems they needed to. Even if there were only a few hundred autonomous communities around the world, which there might already be, incidentally, they still might be able to defend each other from invasion and at the same time help other communities get free and join them. Most of the decisions we take in our lives are, or at least should be, personal. I don't ask my community who I'm allowed to date or what I'm allowed to eat. Community decision making is for issues that affect everyone in the community. But I don't envision a municipality that just provides another level of state power. I envision communities around the world that challenge state and corporate power, that resist encroachment on their freedom and independence, and on sensitive ecological sites around the community. And because there are still a few things that need to be done globally, I can imagine millions of communities working together to do anything. Norms tend to spread around the world, and norms of governance are quite typical that way. If a few communities go sovereign, others will too. If some free communities choose compassionate methods of reconciliation, other communities can learn from them and adopt their practices. But decision-making on the scale of a confederation could take us right back to the problem of the unrepresentative state. So how would we avoid the old pitfalls? Well, how about one person from each community is a delegate? And instead of holding power over the community like a politician, the delegate can only do what is sanctioned by the community. I could imagine a conference where delegates have the choice to vote yes or no on all kinds of proposals, and the delegate from your community votes no because you agreed that's what they would do. That said, there are apps we could use to avoid even having to go to a conference. The Confederation proposes changing this rule, 
Community 7B over here has a meeting and then votes no by pushing a button. It doesn't have to be harder than that. Maybe some decisions made by the Confederation are taken by consensus, while other kinds of def uh, decisions are taken by majority. Like the community, it would have a constitution agreed to by its constituents, and communities can opt out if they don't want to participate. Now, on a final note, if any of these proposals sound hopelessly utopian to you, I urge you to think a bit more about them. The only thing that makes them really unrealistic is the state currently stands in our way. Humans are quite capable of such organization. They demonstrate that every day as they create new organizations and associations and social movements. Even people apparently divided by the ruling class can work together when necessary. Remember the uprising in Egypt in 2011? Within a 48-hour period, at the end of January, every community in Cairo had organized for self-defense. And many of those community organizations became the autonomous communities we're talking about, or at least they did for a while until the Egyptian state shut them down. This was a group of people who had lived under authoritarian rule for how many years? Thousands? <laughs> and yet, they understood freedom, cooperation, and self-defense just as well as everyone else. And they organized. They found an opportunity for self-governance, and they took it. You'll have that, an opportunity like that, too. So I hope you're prepared. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.